the Bohr model of the atom. Giger and Marsden. So remember Rutherford's gold foil experiment where he shot alpha particles at gold foil and most of them passed through but some of them were deflected. Some of them even bounced backwards. So he decided there must be a nucleus inside the center of the atom. So that caused Rutherford to create the planetary model of the atom. There's a nucleus in the middle, like the sun, and the electrons orbit the nucleus, like the planets orbit the sun. But because these particles are charged, and charged particles moving relative to each other are, lose energy, then this model, under classical physics of the day, would predict that the electron would lose energy as it rotated around the nucleus, and then it would crash into the nucleus. So as the electron loses energy, it gets closer and closer and closer to the nucleus, and eventually it crashes into the nucleus. So using classical physics of the day, there was no way around this problem right here, the electron getting closer and closer and closer because positive and negative charges are attracted and the electron loses energy as it moves and crashes right into the nucleus. So Rutherford's nuclear model as a result of the gold foil experiment, remember what came before was the plum pudding model. They didn't know there was a nucleus. They did know there was electrons because J.J. Thompson had shown that there are particles common to all elements um, using his cathode ray tube. And so we knew that there were particles called electrons, but not that there was a nucleus. And so we thought those electrons were dispersed within a cloud of positive charge called the plum pudding model. So. Um, Rutherford's nuclear model, he discovered the nucleus and said, well, most of the atom is empty space. There's a dense nucleus in the center, and the electrons kind of orbit that nucleus like planets orbiting the sun. So here's the sun, here are the electrons orbiting the nucleus. So this was Rutherford's nuclear model. Of course, electrons are moving charged particles. And moving charged particles give off energy. They give off electromagnetic radiation. Therefore, electrons should be glowing because they're giving off energy. And as they give off energy, they should be slowing down. So, they, so electrons should be glowing and they should be slowing down according to this theory. And the atom should collapse because the electron would crash right into the nucleus. But because we know that doesn't happen and everyday objects are not glowing, um, then we know that the, there must be something wrong with this theory. Either the theory itself is wrong, or um, the uh, math, the physics of the day was wrong, classical physics of the day. So Bohr suggested that um, instead of the electron being able to have any energy value, any possible energy value, that the energy of an electron was more like a ladder and um, the electron could be down here at the bottom rung, or the electron could be here in the second rung, but it could, the electron could not have the energy in between. So remember when we saw the, the spiral, we saw the electron spiraling closer and closer and closer to the nucleus until it hits the nucleus. Well, that um, assumes that the electron can get a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer, a little bit closer to the nucleus. Well, Bohr said that's not possible. The electron can get this close. It can go from here to here in one big jump. And it can go from here to here in one big jump. And it can go from here to here in one big jump. But it can't really spiral closer because spiraling closer to the nucleus would kind of imply that the electron was doing this. It was going here, then it gets a little closer, and then it gets a little closer. Now it's here in between those three and four. The electron is now, now it's at three, now it's a little bit less than three, a little bit less, now it's three, two and a half, right? And it's just getting closer and closer and closer. This is what is implied when the electron is spiraling into the nucleus. But Bohr says, no, the electron can be here, then it disappears, and then it reappears and it's right here, and then it slows down a little bit more and it drops right down to this level, and it slows down a little bit more, it's gonna drop down to this level, 
and if it slows down a little bit more it'll drop here and if it slows down a little bit more it'll drop here but if it slows down a little bit more it can't drop any further this is the bottom of the ladder so Bohr said there is a part there is a, the bottom rung of the ladder is as close to the nucleus as the electron can possibly get. It can only climb on these rungs, and when it gets down to the bottom, it can't get any closer. So it can't crash into the nucleus because it can't get closer to the nucleus than the bottom rung of the ladder. So um, what this implies is that how that electron would eventually get from out here and get and fall down because well as I said maybe it was on the outside rung of the ladder and then it goes down to this rung and then this rung and then this rung and this rung well how does the electron get out there in the first place well all atoms are capable of absorbing energy and when atoms absorb energy their electrons start to rotate further away from the nucleus so we can imagine that there's um, an electron that's kind of right here right next this is mercury an electron like mercury rotating right next to the nucleus like mercury rotates next to the sun if that atom absorbs energy whatever this is we'll explain energy later it absorbs energy now this electron that was right next to the nucleus now it's going to shoot way out here and it's going to um, go to one of these outer rungs of the ladder so the electron can gain energy and go from the lowest rung of the ladder out to the outer rung of the ladder and now the electron is suddenly out here now it's mercury the electron gains energy and it goes way out to the last orbit the last rung of the ladder and then out here it's unstable the electron wants to get closer to the nucleus so as it falls down it can't exist in this space in between but it can go from this rung and then suddenly it appears down here in this one n equals four and then n equals four it's going to lose a little bit more energy and it's going to relax it's going to go down here to n equals three and it's going to relax and go down to n equals two and then relax and go down to n equals one so as it's excited it can absorb energy and it can get excited to an outer rung and when it's on an outer rung it can relax the electron can relax back down to an inner rung in order to be excited and move from the inner orbital to an outer orbital an electron must absorb energy and in order for an electron to relax to go from an outer rung down 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 in order for it to relax it must release energy so energy cannot be created or destroyed energy just transforms so energy comes in in some form and it gets transformed the electron goes out here now the electron has more energy it absorbed that energy now the electron itself has more energy now the electrons gonna fall 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 back down and when it falls back down it's losing energy well where does that energy go if energy can't be destroyed well it leaves the atom in some other form it leaves as heat or as light So each wavelength in the spectrum of an atom, we looked at those the absorption spectrum. Go back up here and look at it again for a second. So remember the absorption spectrum, the emission spectrum. Each of these wavelengths in the spectrum corresponds to an electron transition between orbitals. When an electron is excited, when it absorbs energy, it goes from a lower orbital, an inside orbital, to an outer orbital which has higher energy and then the electron relaxes and it goes from an outer orbital to an inner orbital and it loses energy so here is an example of what that looks like for hydrogen in hydrogen an electron can relax from here all the way down to here and when it does it releases this much energy 94 nanometers it releases light with a wavelength of 94 nanometers when the electron relaxes and it goes from here down to here. When the electron relaxes from here from 5 down to 1, it releases 95 nanometers. When it goes from 3 down to 1, 97. 2, down, oh wait, I, 
I said three. This one's three. Three down to one, two down to one. Here, 122 nanometers. So as the electron goes from the outer orbital down to an inner orbital, it has to lose energy, and it loses a very specific amount of energy. Here is the amount of energy that it loses in hydrogen. Every time it goes from here to here, it always loses this amount of energy. Every time it goes from here to here, it always loses this amount. And these, this energy, these are photons of light. So here's a, this is called the Lyman series. Notice that the Lyman series, all of the, they all end on one. So when the electrons go down from any level down to level n equals one, the lowest orbital, then um, we call that the Lyman series, and they lose this much energy. When electrons go from six or five or four or three, and they go from any of those orbitals down to two, n equals two, the second electron shell, when any electron falls here, then we call this the Balmer series, and it loses this much energy. When these electrons go from 6 or 5 or 4, and they fall down to 3, we call that the Passion series, and it loses this much energy. So electrons um, can be excited, and they go to outer orbitals, and that takes energy. It has to absorb energy to do that. And when the electron is out here on an outer orbital, it can relax and go down to an inner orbital. And to do that, it must lose energy. It releases this much energy. So when we look at these lines um, in an absorption spectrum or an emission spectrum, these lines in the absorption spectrum correspond to this. Here's the electron, and n equals 1. That's the first electron shell, the first orbital, as close to the nucleus as it can get. The electron's going round and round on this nucleus. So when it absorbs red, remember red is the lowest energy, and then blue is a little bit higher, a little bit higher, and purple is the highest energy. So when this electron right here absorbs red, it goes from 1 to 2. And when it absorbs that much energy, and now the electron's here in 2, it absorbed this much energy right here. The amount of energy that corresponds to this wavelength, let's call it 655 nanometers or something. Here is another one. That's when the electron's down here at 1. Actually, it looks like all of these are 2, but let's say the electron's down here at 1. Now it absorbs this much energy. This much energy is more than this, because blue is more energy than red. So now the electron's down here. It absorbs blue. Now it's going to go all the way out to 3. Now the electron's here in 3. Uh-oh. The electron is unstable. It wants to go back down to 1. So when it does, it goes from 3 back down to 1, and it has to lose energy. And how much energy does it lose? This right here. It emits, emits this photon. Absorbs photon, electron goes up. Electron goes down, releases photon of the same energy. Absorbs a blue photon, electron goes up to 4. When the electron goes from 4 down to 1, it releases that energy of electron, the same exact one. So it absorbs the energy to go up, it releases the energy to go down. Absorption, emission. We can calculate the amount of energy that's involved in these absorptions and transmissions, emissions, because we know the amount of energy that's associated with a certain wavelength. The energy equals uh, the speed of light divided by the wavelength times Planck's constant. So we know the energy of a photon. We calculated that before. So now we can calculate the energy between electron orbitals, between n equals 1 and n equals 2, these states of an atom, because we know what electrons or what photons are released. When this happens, the electron goes from here to here, I see a red line. I know that that red line is 657 nanometers, and I know that the energy of 600 nanometers I can calculate like this and put 600 energy equals hc over 657 nanometers. So I know what the energy is of this photon. And if I know what the energy is of this photon, then I know what the energy is of this distance right here, because this distance is exactly the same amount of energy, 
that's related to the photon that is released. So I can use this equation to calculate the distance between electron orbitals in an atom. Here's what that looks like. So if I know that the energy of an electron is the change in energy is the difference of the energy of the electron in the final state minus the initial state. If it has a lot of energy in the initial state and less energy in the final state, then that energy of the electron went down and it was released. The emitted photon is, the, is how much energy, the change in energy, uh, is the, uh, the negative of the change in energy of the electron. So what that means is that if I know the energy of a photon uh, using this equation right here, and we know the distance between um, the, we know that the energy value associated with the base level n equals one in a hydrogen atom, that's what this number is right here, then I can figure out where an electron started. Was it at n equals six or n equals five or n equals four? What orbital did it start in? And what orbital did it end in? So to say that again, if I know what the wavelength of the photon is, because I can see it in, the, in this spectrum, I can see these lines, I can measure these wavelengths, I can calculate this energy. If I know what that energy is, then I can also calculate this distance. Well, which transition? 5 to 4, or 5 to 3, or 5 to 2, or 5 to 1, which transition gave me this line right here? I can use this equation to determine that information. So here's what that looks like graphically. The lowest energy, it's a little bit too low here, The lowest energy level uh, for a hydrogen atom, the electron has negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. This is when an electron is in n equals 1, the orbital that's right next to the nucleus. So we can put this picture right over here. Here's the nucleus. Here are my orbitals. And then I can put the numbers on there. This is n equals 1, the closest one, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5. Okay, so this is n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3 and equals 4 and so on. So the energy that's associated with an electron that's right here in the first orbital of a hydrogen atom, this is H, has the electron has this much energy. When the electron goes to n equals 2 and it goes from there to there, now it has this much energy. When the electron goes to n equals 3, now it has this much. n equals 4, now it has this much. n equals 5, now it has this much. When an electron goes all the way to infinity, which means infinity is way out here. In, oops, that looks like an eight. Infinity. That means the electron is no longer stuck to the nuclear to the nucleus. It's a free electron. An electron at infinity means it has broken away from the nucleus. One, two, three, four, five, all the way out to infinity. This electron is no longer stuck. The negative and the positive are broken apart now. So we say that an electron out here has an energy of zero. And as the electron gets closer to the nucleus, its energy goes down and becomes negative. Notice all of these are negative energies. So these are just the numbers, the joule, the value of energy that's associated with electrons and associated with these different gaps in between the orbitals on a hydrogen atom.
So if an electron starts in orbital 1, the closest to the nucleus, that electron can go up to orbital 2, or it can go from 1 to 3, or it can go from 1 to 4, 1 to 5, 1 to 6, 1 to infinity. The, all, the electrons can go from 1 to any of the other orbitals. So if an electron could go from 1 to 2, then when it's in 2, it can go from 2 to 3. And when it's in 3, it can go from 3 to 4. And when it's in 4, it can go to 4 to 5. And vice versa, when an electron, if I have an electron that's out here in uh, n equals 5, and that electron is going to fall, eventually it's going to fall back to 1, how many different paths can it take? Well, E can go from 5 to 1. Um, but E could also go from 5 to 2, and then to 1. Um, and 5 could also go from 5 to 3, and 3 to 2, and 2 to 1. So it could go 5, 3, 2, 1. And obviously it could go to 4, and then 3, and then 2, and then 1. So an electron could take this path. So if an electron is out in um, orbital 5, and it's going to fall down to orbital 1, it's going to be possible that that electron can take lots of different paths, or that if there are lots of electrons in orbital 5, they can all take lots of different paths down to 1. And when they do that, they're going to make lots of different lines in the spectrum, lots of different spectral lines. So how many? Well, if I have an electron that's in 2, it can only go down, it can only do one path, 2 to 1. If, an I, have, if I have an electron that's in um, orbital 3, it can go from 3 to 1, or 3 to 2, and 2 to 1. So it goes 3 to 1, or 3 to 2 to 1. So how many different lines would I expect to see in the spectrum? I'd get one line from this transition. I'd get one line in the spectrum from this transition, 3 to 2. And I'd get one line in this transition from 2 to 1. So I would get three total lines in the spectrum. Here's my spectrum. right? I get a green one, maybe, and a red one, maybe and a yellow one. So I would get three different lines in my spectrum if I had an electron that was stuck at n equals 3, because it could go all the way from 3 to 1, and that would make the yellow one, let's say. And then it could go from 3 to 2, and that would make the green one. And then it would go from 2 to 1, and that would make the red one. So I'd get three different lines in my spectrum. So we can calculate um, how many different lines we would expect in the spectrum from an electron that's starting in any orbital by taking this line of thought. Just thinking about all the different kinds of paths that an electron could take from 2 to 1, or 3 to 1, or 5 to 1. Okay, using the following equation, calculate the wavelength of the photon released when an excited electron drops from the fifth energy level to the second energy level of a hydrogen atom. So again, remember we said this is the energy that's associated with an electron when it's in the lowest energy level of a hydrogen atom, n equals 1. So the energy, the change in energy from an electron that's falling from 5 the fifth energy level to the second from 5 to 2, I can calculate that using this equation and plugging the 5 and the 2 in here. So let's try this out. Uh, 
All right, delta E equals negative 2.178 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times 1 over n final. So what is the final orbital that my electron ends up in? This one says an excited electron drops from 5 to 2. So the final energy, where does it end up? n equals 2. Squared. Don't forget the square. Minus 1 over n initial. This is where the electron started. Where did it start? The electron drops from 5, so it started at 5. 5 squared. All right, let's plug this into the calculator. I get 1 fourth minus 1 25th. All right, so if I multiply, if I subtract 1 fourth, 1 25th from 1 fourth, then I'm left with 0.21. And then if I multiply that by 2.178 times 10 to the negative 18 joules, equals four negative four point five seven three eight times ten to the negative nineteen joules. Alright. So the energy this is the change in energy from the electron falling from five to two. So how much energy does the photon have that is emitted when this electron goes from five to two? Well, remember the photon has the exact same amount of energy uh, that this lost. So if the electron is losing four, negative 4.5738 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, then the photon has positive 4.5738 times 10 to the negative 19 joules because the photon took that energy. So this is the change of the energy in the electron. Therefore, the energy of the photon equals plus 4.5738 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Okay, so I know the energy of the electron, excuse me, the energy of the photon that's associated with this electron transition. So now, what is the wavelength that's associated with this energy of photon? So remember that the wavelength and the energy are related. H C over lambda, or lambda equals H C over the energy of the photon. So H is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. Planck's constant. It's a constant. It's always the same. The speed of light is a constant. 2.99 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Divided by the energy. 4.5738 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So let's look at our units here. Joules and joules will cancel. Seconds and per second will cancel. So we'll be left with meters. And meters is distance. And I'm trying to calculate wavelength. So I'll be left with some unit of meters, probably nanometers. So this is good. All right, let's put this into the calculator here. 6.626 
EE negative 34 times 2.99 EE8 divided by 4.5738 EE negative 19. So, lambda equals 4.33 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Or we could also say 433 times 10 to the negative 9 meters, which is also 433 nanometers. So this is the wavelength that's associated from um, a drop from the fifth energy to the second energy in a hydrogen atom, 433 nanometers, 5 to 2. Let's check. All right, so when I go from 5, n equals 5, down to n equals 2, that's part of the Balmer series in hydrogen, and the nanometers, the wavelength should be 434. And I calculated 433, so pretty close, right? These, um, so this equation is a good equation to be able to calculate the wavelength from one, um, the energy associated with the, one of these electron transitions. What is the maximum number of emission lines when the excited electron of an H atom in N equals 6 drops to the ground state? All right, so let's see. Oops. All right, so let's look at all the different ways that an electron that starts in 6 can get down to 1. Come on. All right, it can go from 6 to 5, 6 to 4, 6 to 3, 6 to 2, or 6 to 1. So if, starting from 6, it could go to any of those. So if it could get from 6, then it could get to 5. So from 5, it could get this, 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 this. I don't know why I went down on the first one and up on the second one. But the point being that if I'm starting in 6, I can get to any level below it. If I'm starting in 5, I can get to any level below it. If I'm starting in 4, I can get to any level below it. So from 4, I can go from here to here to here. 4 to 3, 4 to 2, 4 to 1. I'm running out of colors here. Let's see. The black. So if I'm in 3, I can go from here to here. And I've only got one left. Make it red. Here to here. So these are all the possible transitions that if an electron is in 6, that electron can get to. Any, it can go to any level below it, including 5. So if that electron from 6 finds its way to 5, it can take any of these paths. If that electron from 6 finds its way to 4, it can take any of these paths. If that electron from 6 finds its way to 3, it can take any of these paths. And if that electron from 6 finds its way to 2, it can take this path. So how many is that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So how many emission lines would we see? 15.